sounds working. Say something, Michelle. I'm here. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, so we'll get you to just start sharing your slides here in just a minute, okay? Okay. Okay, because you're up first. All right. Thank you, Pablo. No, I with I just wanted to know which one it is. Yeah. It's this one? Yes. Okay. Hey, Michelle, are you awake? You're on mute, but that's okay. barely <laughs> not enough to unmute myself. Okay, that's okay. You got a couple minutes, don't panic. Okay. Oh, wait, I got my glasses. Okay. I promise. I'm a full service session chair. <laughs> what did I do? I stopped sharing my screen. Oh, okay. That's okay. Wait. Okay. She stopped sharing her screen, she said. Oh, oh she stopped. Slides. I'm oh. still sharing my screen, but not okay. my slides. Gotcha. That's fine. That's good. This is actually a good splash. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> But we need to give a couple of, another couple of minutes for everybody to find the best session, which is obviously this one. <clears throat> <laughs> right, Michelle, over you. You want to do that? Or should we do it now? There we go. There we go. There we go. Um, are we recording yet? Yeah. Oh.
I have to be careful. I have to not make too bad of jokes. Okay. It's not time yet. I shouldn't put this here because I feel the need to scribble on it. It's, you know, it's clean, multiple markers. Just to show you how flexible I'm being now, I'm going to start one minute late on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I can do that. Well, good deal. So now we can start. It's the longest minute of my life. Gonna start to hyperventilate. <laughs> okay, it's 1.31. <laughs> Welcome everyone to uh, to session I2. The, this is always a very difficult part of the uh, program because everybody's still a little bit tired from the wonderful, sorry, Michelle, we had a great dinner last night. We thought of you. Um, and and you're, we're not quite at the closing ceremony, which everybody has to go to because it's awesome. Um, but now we're going to learn all kinds of really good stuff from um, from the presenters in this session. I do have to start with an apology from Robin Rice. Um, she will not be able to present today. Uh, she she woke up to actually she went to bed to an email from KLM saying her flight had been canceled, and if she wanted to go home before Monday, she had to go this morning. So um, she sends her apologies, and she will post a recording of her presentation in the Whova app um, when she gets home. She threatened to try and do her presentation from her layover in Schiphol Airport. And I, I told her no, because that is generous, but um, stressful. So um, the three speakers that we do have in this session have plenty of time. We have lots of time for questions. Um, so I don't want anybody to feel, I, I'm not gonna hold up my five minutes left sign. I think we're gonna be good. Um, and so we have one remote presentation and two uh, in-person presentations. And uh, I will get started with the introductions. So Michelle Hazlett has been the librarian for numeric data and data management at the university libraries at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for more than 10 years. She worked previously in similar jobs at the State Library of North Carolina and the North Carolina State University Libraries. She currently sits on the National Steering Committee of the American Community Survey Data Users Group. Okay, um, her work is joint with Matt Jansen, who I believe is not gonna be joining us today. Is that correct, Michelle? He's here. Oh, is he gonna talk? Uh, he's not gonna help with the presentation, but he's gonna help with the questions. Okay, in that case, I will read his bio too. Um, he's the data analysis librarian for the university libraries at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Drawing on a background in social sciences and statistics, he provides support for researchers and students on data preparation and analysis across a variety of data formats and research goals, including analysis of text corpora. I love when people get the plural of that right. He also teaches and support he also teaches and supports methods for reproducible science from coding languages like Python and R to version control and code sharing with tools like GitHub. Um, they will be pre presenting today on factors affecting deposits in data repositories. So please a warm welcome for Michelle and Matt. Thank you for that introduction, San. Uh, I will warn you as I'm speaking with my slides in presentation mode, I can't see what's happening in the room. So um, I can hear still. So shout out if something happens, I need to know. Don't worry, Sophie will tell you if something goes badly wrong. All right. So uh, our research question for this project was to investigate what factors make data repository successful in recruiting deposits. 
and we were specifically looking at deposits of data and not deposits broadly. We had eight hypotheses. Um, I'm not going to read these word for word. I'm just going to say what we were looking at was correlations between the number of depositors, not deposits, um, with other characteristics of the repositories that we had respond. So um, the first, you know, characteristic was um, having a larger number of staff in the repository, then whether they offered advanced curation services like staff verification of files or code, scanning for personally identifiable information, that kind of thing. Then whether they got referrals from faculty, um, whether their depositors were referred by other faculty or whether those referrals came from other places in their organization. Um, we did not limit to institutional repositories, but uh, invited repositories broadly of any type across North America to respond. And then uh, the fourth one was whether or not they use social media to promote their repository. Um, whether they link to electronic lab notebooks for automated deposit, whether they encrypted data as a service, and whether they had staff dedicated to data deposits in particular, as opposed to other kinds of deposits. Finally, we asked about, we looked at uh, the age of the repository, whether older repositories had more depositors. So our methodology was to administer a survey in Qualtrics. We promoted the survey to three email lists, including iAssist. The other two were RDAP, the uh, Research Data Access and Preservation Association, and DataCure, which is not really affiliated with an association, but is a list for professional curators, data curators. In our uh, testing, in our analysis, we focused on two-way relationships. Um, and I'll talk about that more in just a minute. So it's difficult to calculate a response rate for our survey. Um, first of all, there's no complete count anywhere of repositories. And second, because we were promoting to listservs, we don't know how many people actually received our invitation to the survey, but we had 32 complete submissions. Um, we had a lot more incomplete answers. I was kind of surprised at the number of incomplete answers, but um, 32 was the number of people who responded. So in our results, the hypotheses that have blue text are the ones that we proved um, to be true, that there was a significant correlation between having a larger number of depositors and having a larger staff. Um, we calculated that on average, the number of depositors went up by 2% for each additional staff member. Then for two and four, um, there was a significant association with having a larger number of depositors, both for offering advanced curation services and for using social media as a marketing method. Um, the abbreviation DIM is for difference in median, and you see the definition in light blue at the bottom of the slide. So the difference in median depositors between repositories that either offered advanced curation or used social media and those that didn't. Number three was, oh, I should say, uh, in terms of offering advanced curation services, the difference in mean went up by 12 and a half for those that did offer advanced curation services. They had 12 and a half more uh, depositors as a median. And in terms of using social media, the group that did use social media had on 
a median more depositors of 22. So it was pretty significant. For hypothesis three, uh, almost all of the repositories that responded had referrals from faculty. And so there, were, there weren't two categories that we could test. So we weren't able to do a test with that one. Um, likewise, but kind of in the opposite way for five and six, almost none of the repositories that responded either offered encryption or linkage with an electronic lab notebook. So we weren't able to do anything with those either. There was a significant correlation with having a larger staff specifically devoted to data as opposed to other kinds of deposits. And then for number eight, this was the only hypothesis that we disproved. Um, repository age was not significantly correlated with numbers of depositors. So more proof if you needed it that the old adage, build it and they will come, is untrue. So we have a number of limitations. Obviously, the small sample size was one. Non-response bias was the big one for us. We don't know who didn't answer. So um, in the consent information, we stipulated that we would be depositing our data and one of our uh, conclusions is we, we can't help but wonder if that deterred participation. Our research doesn't account for causation, so we don't know that using social media to promote the repository brought in more depositors. Um, it's possible that having more depositors meant that there just was a larger staff, more resources, somebody had time to do social media posts. So um, the direction of that correlation is unknown. And then finally, a cross-sectional approach would be interesting. This was a point in time survey. And if the survey was run year after year, some of those relationships might become clearer. So it's interesting to note those sort of points of unbalance that our respondents were having great success with faculty referrals, relationships with faculty, um, people getting their colleagues to deposit where they had deposited. And then on the other hand, that most of our respondents were not offering more advanced services. Our recommendations for further research um, should explore whether that stated intent to deposit the research data may have interfered with people actually participating in the survey. Um, that would be sort of one of the first points that I would be interested in investigating further. And then secondly, future research might also want to test the directionality of that social media connection. Uh, other repositories could certainly uh, test that in sort of an informal way. Um, for number three, I don't know that it's going to be very easy for repositories to offer more advanced curation services. Um, it's really a matter of resources, and we all know resources are limited these days. And then, of course, repositories are going to want to continue maintaining those good relationships with faculty. Um, I'm not sure if we're taking questions now or at the end. Yes, we can take questions now. Okay. Are you all done? Uh, we have I to applaud am. first. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, questions in the room for Michelle. All the way in the back. Oh, okay. Are you running? Okay. okay. Reach in the middle. Thanks. Um, thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, so one question I had was around the um, the repositories themselves that responded, um, because obviously 
well, not necessarily obviously, but I would imagine if a repository was attached to, say, a larger institution, it's just the fact that it's attached to a larger institution may end up with, you know, a greater population of academics sending data to that repository, or, or if the repositories are serving particular um, subject areas, it may be that there's simply more research conducted in that subject area. And so actually the, the variations seen may be more due to to those sort of background things. And I just wondered whether you controlled for that in, in your work or whether that was possible to do so with the data you had. We did not control for that. And I think it would be difficult from this particular survey to do that. Um, but that's a good point. That's something that um, we'll make note of for next time. Great. Thank you. I'll jump in and make an extra comment on that. I think one of the other problems that was the sharing of the data, as Michelle mentioned, and I think a lot of that really quickly leads to identifiability. Right. If we know a particular subject area is a particular size in a particular area, it very we wanted to keep the data at least somewhat anonymous looking for the shared uh, version at the end. Thanks, Matt. Any other questions in the room? I have a question, just kind of building sure. on that, that idea of um, this question you guys had as a follow-up of whether the fact that you told people that you were going to share the data set um, could have impacted participation. Did you ask repositories to identify themselves then? Or I mean, were they, and was it a completely anonymous survey or was, were, did you ask them the name of the repository when they um, completed the survey? No, we did not ask for people to name their repository, but there, so for one thing, it was a long survey. And so we asked a lot of different things. And across all of that, there were a number of places where people could write in answers. So in terms of, um, you know, sort of the incidental information that they shared, a lot of that did become identifying. People talked about the consortia that they were part of. Um, people talked about their budgets. So there was a lot of information there that ended up identifying people. In terms of what we plan to deposit from our responses, we're looking at, like there could have been a lot more hypotheses that we published about, but these eight, when you look at those data, they're not going to probably identify the particular repositories. It may still be possible to make some assumptions about who was whom on the outliers, at least. So um, we are being very careful about trying to keep it as limited as possible so as not to identify people. Um, we did ask a question at the end of the survey about what people thought about depositing the data. And there were a lot of responses that said they were pretty uneasy about it. We um, asked people to indicate what audiences they felt the data could be shared with or should be shared with. and even when it was sort of locked down to only researchers in this field, uh, researchers who were concerned about repositories, in particular data repositories, they were very hesitant about have, letting the data be released. Thanks, Michelle. That's a very interesting finding given the, the, the sample. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, any, any other questions in the room? Anything on the chat, Sophia? Oh, there we go. Um, just a comment to that topic. We had a very similar survey with research data centers in Germany um, that we presented this morning, and we had the same question, and we uh, and we knew people would be hesitant to answer our survey, and we assured them that only anonymized data will be published, if at all. So if we find that we cannot anonymize them because they share, like, just because the nature of the of the participants is so obvious that you can identify some someone, 
then we won't share. It's just uh, not possible then. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, going once, going twice. All right, another round of applause. Thank Michelle and Matt. Thank you, sorry we can't be there. Go okay, now we're going to go to the, the in-person conversations um, and we'll talk about our next, I'm going to introduce you while she does this, if that's okay. All right. Um, so Lorenzo is a product director at Elsevier and focuses on research data management. As part of his role, he leads a team that develops solutions for institutions to advance and accelerate accelerate their open data programs. Lorenzo is actively involved in the RDM community, being a member of RDA and holding a co-chair role in the Scholix initiative, but also interacting frequently with institutions to fix my, there we go, to discuss best practices and how to accelerate RDM. Prior to joining Elsevier, Lorenzo has hold, held various product management roles in different industries. He started his professional career as a researcher at Philips Research, where he co-authored several articles and patents on visible light communication. Lorenzo holds an MSc in telecommunications, telecommunications engineering and a master's in business administration. His presentation is joint work with Federico Rosetta and is titled, Where is the Majority? Oh, that's the wrong one. Um, we have time. Um, where is the majority of institutional research data hosted? How universities can keep oversight of data and deploy effective RDM practices. And as soon as we get Lorenzo, there we go. Yay. Um, can you please help me welcome Lorenzo Ferry? Thank you, Sen. You're welcome. Thank you all. <clears throat> Um, so let me start with the key takeaway of my presentation, and I will do it by asking a question. Do your institutions have visibility on the research data published by your researchers? Do you have an overview of that research data? This is what we have been working on with my team in the last years, and that's what I would like to talk to you about. Um, I will do so by uh, starting with a um, brief introduction about um, what I see happening in uh, research data management. And I've been working in RDM now for a few years, and I've seen in the last years there has been a big increase in or in the traction of uh, RDM and data sharing. And I think there are three main forces behind this acceleration in the last years uh, being funders and their policies and the increase in funders' policies, uh, publishers and their policies and increase thereof, um, but also governments who are getting an increasing interest uh, in open data and data sharing. And we now see many governments actually uh, are writing strategic agendas on open data. So a bit more on funders. Just have a look at the graph and you see what has been happening in the last eight, nine years with data sharing policies by funders, you see a clear growth. And that's actually um, something that has been driving uh, a lot of adoption and a lot of behaviors. What they particularly like, you know, that they want to call out is what the European Commission says in their data sharing policy. They say there is no opting out of RDM. So open data is a key priority for researchers that work with the European Commission or with those fundings. The NIH in the US recently published, actually last year, end of the last year, published a new policy, data sharing policy, which will be effective in the beginning of the next year. There was an article recently, you see it up there, NIH issues a seismic mandate, share data publicly. Publishers, publishers can and do play a big role in accelerating data sharing with policies. There are many journals in many publish with many publishers that require data to be shared for researchers to actually publish an article. And in the graph, you see what this has meant in the past year. So this graph shows the number of publications with linked data in the past years. And again, we see a healthy growth. We like to see this. Talking about governments, 
governments around the world are now defining strategic agendas on open data, data sharing. And what I'm really, really happy to see is that it's not just the quote unquote most mature countries like France. We also see other countries like Malaysia, Colombia, that are writing plans, national plans on open data. We are in Gothenburg in Sweden. So I also want to mention what is happening in Sweden. There's a big plan and there's a big push towards open data. A 2026, uh, a 2026 um, goal to make open data a reality. What I, I've been talking to many universities in the past years and administrators at many universities and I know that there's a number of initiatives that administrators and uh, universities are putting in place to support their researchers with data sharing. And that's great. And, you know, um, I've been collecting my top five initiatives based on what I've learned from talking to you. Um, and, and so this is the, you know, these are the most common practices I see with universities hiring data stewards or data librarians. So, specialists who can help researchers with data sharing. Data management plans. I mean, we all know about data management plans and I believe actually data management plans are a very good driver for adoption of data sharing. It's a very good first step to encourage researchers. Data repositories. Many institutions decide to develop or acquire a data repository, an institutional data repository to let their researchers deposit their data in the repository. Reporting, and this is uh, depending also on the countries, but reporting, for example, on compliance to data sharing policies by funders, for example. Sometimes it's reporting to the data sharing policy of a given institution. And then of course, showcasing I was talking to an, to an administrator in, uh, in the Netherlands. I'm based in the Netherlands. So I have frequent interaction with Dutch universities. And she gave me a, a beautiful quote. She told me, what's the point of open data if we don't make an effort to make it findable and visible? So showcasing it and putting it out there is really important. But then you see at the bottom, there's a challenge that is emerging particularly when you want to try and report on data sharing or when you want to showcase your open data, where is the institution's research data? That's where it started. Do you know where your researchers are publishing their research data? It turns out that the majority of the universities I talk with do not know. And the reason why that's the case is really simple. This is the reason. We have made a study and we found that up to 90%, up to 90% of the research data for a given institution is deposited outside of the institutional repository, right? So as an institution, you have an institutional repository, you expect the researchers to deposit data there and to have visibility, but the vast majority is somewhere else. Where is it? In domain specific repositories, for example, or other generalist repositories. I was talking to a geneticist um, a few months ago and he told me, when I publish my genetic codes, I will want to do it in GenBank because that's where all my peers will go and find research data. If I do it in my institutional repository, I would be invisible, nobody would find my data. And it's, and it's actually also funders that do encourage researchers to deposit their data in domain specific repositories for the same reason. So this is actually a healthy, Goods practice, domain specific repositories are good places for quality research data. But then it poses a challenge for administrators and institutions, where is my research data? Because there are thousands of public repositories, domain specific repositories. Um, so I started this project a few years ago, working with uh, a couple of Dutch universities and also two Belgian universities. And one of those was uh, the University of Groningen. And the University of Groningen is, to my knowledge, based on my experience, one of the uh, earliest universities that tried to try that tried to find their research data. Where is my missing 90% research data? 
And the team at the University of Groningen, well, they, in the beginning, they were using brute force because that's what they had, you know? So the, the RDM team went through a hero heroic efforts. They spent their hours finding the data, looking through repositories, thousands of, or hundreds of, or thousands of repositories. And that's actually where the idea of this project started because they realized that, you know, the manual approach was not scalable. So we started working on a project called Data Monitor. And Data Monitor, what Data Monitor tries to do is try to automate the process. So tries to help the University of Groningen to automate finding all the research data. How does Data Monitor, what, what's the gist? What is it, the idea of Data Monitor? It's really simple. We are collecting through open APIs, through public APIs, the research data metadata from, from thousands of repositories. And then crucially, we, we have to cleanse it. We have to cleanse the metadata. We have to enrich the metadata because unfortunately, whether we like it or not, the practice of metadata annotation with researchers is still not great. So we see that there are a lot of holes in the metadata of public records. For example, the institution affiliation is often missing or link publications, the, the link publication is often missing. And these are crucial metadata elements if you want to uh, make sense of what's going on with your research data. So we try to fill in the gaps as much as possible. And then, um, and then uh, you know, the result is, a, is an index where we, that, that helps institutions like University of Groningen to find their research data. Data monitor, we try to monitor research data. And I'm really proud to say, you know, so far things, um, you know, the, the, the first results are encouraging. Uh, you know, there we now work with um, various institutions and these are three institutions that we work with or we collaborate with. And if you have a look at the amount of research data or data sets in the institutional repository versus their total research data that's striking. And actually you see that it doesn't really matter which provider, which solution you're using as, as an institutional repository is that does not make the difference. What makes a difference is the nature, the, the, the desire to publish in domain specific repositories. Um, so once you have visibility on your research data, what do you do? What do universities do? Those universities who got there? A number of things. I mentioned showcasing. What is the point of open data if we don't make an effort to make it findable and visible? So showcasing. Also showcasing that as a university, we are committed to open data. But also understanding current data sharing practices. One administrator was telling me, in our university, we are not trying to go against the flow. We try to see the best practices in data sharing in our institution, and then we try to reinforce those because we believe that's the, the best, the most effective change management process to encourage data sharing. We should encourage more of the successful stories. So you want to understand what's happening. And then understanding how, as a university, you're progressing towards open data and more. And I would like to leave you with an analysis, <clears throat> very recent, and it's an exploration so far, um, that we are doing on a macro level. So, so far we spoke about universities and visibility on the research data on a university level and progress towards open data on a university level, but you can do the same on a country level, right? So, we have been doing an exercise and it's an exploration and it's not perfect, but it shows some insights. I want to share this with you uh, as a preliminary result. So we've done that for Sweden and the Netherlands um, and have a look. So this is, this is a trend in blue Sweden, in orange the, uh, the Netherlands. It's a trend line that shows Research data, research data publication in these two countries in the last 10, 11 years. Now, I'm going to talk about the spike in a second. I think what I want to call out here is the trends. Again, an encouraging trends. If you look at the number 29%, 25, 29, 25%, that's a year-on-year -year growth in data shares 
in, in those countries, that's great. You know, there's a huge growth in data sharing in these countries. Now on to the spike. Um, we're looking into this, but the hypothesis is that this is due to a bulk submission at one specific repository. We think is a Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics. We have to, we want to talk to them to understand, but we believe what happened is that there was a bulk upload. Perhaps they digitalized a lot of paper records and now they put a DOI and they digitalized them and there was a, in one given year, uh, a bulk upload. So again, I said, this is preliminary. There's a lot of work to do, but I think what's encouraging here is the trends. I also spoke about best practices. So what, what are the top, repositories where researchers in Sweden and the Netherlands are depositing their data. Any, any guess? Does anybody want to take a guess? What is the top repository? I'm gonna show it. That's the big blob in blue. That's Figshare. And then you see in the case of the Netherlands, the nodal number three. So two generous repositories are the two largest repositories. Um, you also see the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics. Again, there, we have to understand exactly the, the details there, but certainly a, a large number of records and many other. So again, if you try to understand what's going on with my researchers and what are the best practices, what are they doing today? This gives you some insights. And then I think my, my preferred slides, my, my favorite slides, the last slides, um, open access and open science. Um, I think the holy grail is when open, when the publication and the data is open, you know, both of them, because then you have access to the full, uh, to the full research. So that's what we're trying to analyze here. The ratio between open access article with linked data out of the total open access articles. I must say, I find this slightly disappointing. I think we can do a lot better. You see it's hovering between six and seven. And by the way, decreasing in 2020, 2021, this might also be a lag in measurements. Uh, we have seen a lag in measurements. So please do not judge or do not be you know, uh, do not pay your attention to 2021, but in general, six to 7%, I think we can do better than that. All right, that was uh, what I wanted to share. Um, great, so we do have one online question. Um, how does data monitor work harvest the appropriate metadata? Um, are they simple? Are you guys simply using ROAR or other techniques? Um, so what we do is we use public APIs um, from repositories to harvest the metadata. Um, some cases we do direct using the direct API from the repository. Other times we use data site as an aggregator. Um, ROAR, so ROR is the one of the institutional identifiers that we use. Um, ORCIDs is another one. There's a number of identifiers that we use to try and, and enrich the metadata as much as possible. Thank you. Questions in the room? Oh, 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 you just snuck in. So, so uh, I, I think the the uh, initiative to uh, require data publication from the publishers are are excellent. Do you also discuss a requirement on the data to have sufficient metadata and being understandable as well? Is there any discussions going on in that direction? I think you mentioned it a bit briefly in your presentation. Yeah. Um, um, so I think it's a great point you're making. I think that um, I should have mentioned it. Let me mention it now. I think that um, we will only get good visibility if we um, educate, if we help researchers to 
um, and encourage researchers to improve the metadata quality. So that must be a priority for all of us. That's necessary. Um, the thing is, uh, publishers um, oftentimes use a, th a third party repository. For example, I've shown Figshare and the big amount of data sets in Figshare. Uh, Springer Nature, for example, uses an, ins an instance of Figshare to deposit their data. So it's really up to the, to the repository where the data set is deposited to define what are the required fields. But maybe let me mention something. I'm involved in an initiative now with the NIH in the US. The NIH is trying to, because it, it touches on your point. So I think there are, uh, there are actions in the direction. So what the NIH is trying to do is, to, is trying to um, identify a group of generalist repositories that will meet a basic standard of metadata that is required for the NIH to endorse these repositories. And the, the, ultimately, the NIH wants to make sure that uh, res, their, the researchers with, with the NIH funding have a quality repository to, uh, to keep their metadata, to keep their data sets. And as part of these projects uh, that's, that I'm involved in, we are defining what are the metadata fields that are expected for these generalist repositories to be considered consider of good enough quality. And for example, it, it started, it's, it's, so the first milestone will be in June. So, you know, it's, we cannot even talk about the results, but uh, in my working group, which is on, uh, on search and browse, we are defining what are the expected metadata fields. And we are proposing things like um, the author identifier. So the ORCIDs or the institutional identifier or the funder identifier. So, so, you know, I can only speak about my personal initiative in this sense, but uh, yes, it's happening. And I think it's really important for that to happen. So we have one more question in the chat. Um, so this is from Michelle. Um, so what I see with depositors is that researchers find it so much easier to deposit in an IR instead of a disciplinary repository due to the latter's high metadata standards. Um, is there a balance to be struck um, there to make it easier for researchers to deposit in disciplinary repositories, or how do we encourage researchers to create better metadata? A hard question. That is a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I will ask the help of the audience. I mean, it's it's a great question. It's a great question. I, I can't claim I can give a straight answer. You know, I would lie. I think it's it's I think it's probably a, a you know a good question for all of us to think of. I, I think it points in the right direction. Um, but honestly, it's hard for me to give a, a good answer to that question. Anybody else want to take a stab at that one? Because I, I agree, that's a very, very hard question. Um, no, a few of us were having this discussion at lunch and we didn't come up with the answer, so it can't be done. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, was the, what was the thinking that, you were discuss that came from the discussion? So, so it's interesting because I'm thinking I'm I'm going to warn everybody I'm an economist by training and so I can't help myself. Um, but the whole notion about the incentives, right? And so that's where you have to the, the, this carrot versus stick. And there's a lot of disciplines for which carrots are just not effective, or they would be so difficult to to actually enact that you'd really need to think about it from a stick perspective. And so I think some of the ideas were um, from the institution side, making it part of the, the a researcher's, you know, sort of um, progression and journey you know, yeah. from a promotional standpoint. And then yeah. the other thing, to be honest, that one of the other things is, is the publication requirements, um, at not just the requirements, but the notion that they are actually enforced because um, I know in economics a few years ago that it's, uh, a few people did a follow up and found that you know there was a lot of journals that have a, a data repository requirement, but nobody ever follows up on it, and mm -hmm. something like sixty percent of the data were either missing or not usable. Mm -hmm. So th that's those are the sorts of things. But it really gets down to how do you make it? It's the what's in it for me for the researcher because all you're doing is taking away time from their research endeavors. So. That, that and that that was the train of thought but again everything has a price a cost of some sort and somebody has to bear that cost the researchers are not willing to do it so who is so i it's a great point and allow it allows me to add uh, something i could have um added to my uh, story but um 
what we see, and I believe, so I've seen actually a publication a couple of years ago, I think the title was The Citation Advantage. So there was an independent study being done that observed that publications with linked data tend to have higher citation scores systematically. Um, I, you know, I, I was not the author of that research, so I can't give you the details, but I'm, you know, I can provide the reference uh, if somebody wants it. I must say I've seen that in, uh, in analysis that, that we did also uh, with other tools that systematically we see that publications with linked data are correlated with, high, with, more cita with higher citation metrics. Of course, there's a very interesting discussion to be had on what is the causality here? What is the driver? You know, that, that probably requires a whole session, but I think the, it is striking and it is insightful to see that there is this correlation. I think it's a starting point at least. Right, I'm gonna take chair's prerogative because I have the microphone and you can't stop me. Um, I also wonder um, from the perspective of disciplinary differences. Um, so I know that there are so many areas where primary data is, is the number one thing. And yet there are other areas like economics where we don't have the ability to conduct controlled experiments something about they won't let us control people's lives and see what happens and whatnot. So, and especially with the concept that, that is coming out now of the value of data and data brokers and there being contractual limitations. So we don't have the issue necessarily of um, worrying about de-identification and personal, you know, mm -hmm. and personal issues. Um, but if you have to pay Bloomberg $20,000 for the time series data that you need to do a particular thing, the whole notion of being able to share that is it's just impossible. And so that's really another challenge is to say, how do you deal with the concept of not necessarily, as Anya was saying that, you know, that people are uncomfortable with the sharing, but you legally cannot do so from a yep. contractual perspective. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So fix that, please. What's that? I, I will. That, I will. Let me, okay. let me take a note. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have another one. Well, we just have a, one last comment in the chat that I'll, I'll mention for the audience here for anybody who's not online. Um, so there's also a comment that there's a role here for choice architecture and removing kind of the sludge to make metadata completion easier. So must much more likely. So I'm hearing there like, how do we streamline some of our own processes to um, make that metadata creation easier for our researchers? I think it's a great point. I, you know, again, that's uh, that requires a different discussion, but it's it's a point that I often hear that sometimes infrastructure is not just uh, good enough. You know, so the burden on researchers is is such that it's actually acting as a disincentive. And yep. all right, can we another round of applause for Lorenzo, please? Excellent. And last but certainly not least, um, no, we have to. How do you say your last name so I don't make it up? Kivom. Okay. John Kivom is a senior advisor at SICT. Okay, good. The Norwegian Agency for Shared Services in Education and Research, where, spe where he specializes in open science, data sharing, data management, data management planning, and data data protection. He is also involved in several different international projects and initiative. Like, I know some of you guys have know how to pronounce these ac acronyms, but I don't. So I'm just going to spell them out. EOSC, European Open Science Cloud, RDA, I know what I know, uh, Research Data Alliance, and CESDA. Uh, his talk today is titled NSD DMP Toward a Fair Ecosystem for Data Management Planning, unless you changed it. Yay. Anyway, uh, a warm welcome, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Sound sound is good. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I will just jump right into it. I'm going to talk about a few attempt steps we have made in at SICT NSD, uh, like we were called before, uh, towards making a national um, fair ecosystem for data management planning. So first, I just want to say a few words about this new SICT organization where I work, Norwegian Agency for Shared Services in Education and Research. So we are a um, fairly recent uh, new organization established uh, this year, 1st of January, uh, through a merger between um, NSD, Norwegian Center for Research Data, and two other 
governmental bodies, UNINET and UNIT. And I have been working at NSD for many years, and that's where these tools that I'm going to talk about today were uh, developed. And that's also why the name of, uh, of the proposal in the program is NSD DMP, but this, it's going to be rebranded into SICT uh, DMP. So yeah, anyway, we are a public uh, administrative body under the, the Ministry of Education and Research, uh, approximately 370 employees in three offices in Trondheim, Bergen and Oslo. And so basically the goals of, uh, of SICT is to uh, facilitate for more open research, more open data, and um, while simultaneously uh, strengthen the information security and the, and the data protection in, in the knowledge sector overall. So we, basically we try to provide tools, uh, tools and services that uh, make data as open as possible, but also uh, as close as necessary. So we do this by providing several uh, uh, services for the sector. Um, I'm gonna just to highlight a few things that are relevant today. Uh, we do a lot of things um, now that we have become this huge governmental body. But one of the main things we do, we, we give advice on, uh, on data protection and information security. Uh, we, we provide uh, data protection services to uh, over 100 uh, Norwegian research and education institutions, all of the big universities and, um, and several research institutes and other competence and re research centers. Um, and we also uh, store, archive and, and disseminate various uh, uh, data sources, mostly within uh, um, the humanities and social science. And we also uh, provide them uh, data management planning tools and services, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So these are, um, oh, this is the, the sort data management plan service bundle, uh, which uh, consists of three tools. It's data, data management plan tool, which um, is then um, where the researchers can create and write their data management plan. It's um, openly available to all, all researchers from all uh, disciplines covers all the standard DMP templates from, uh, from the European Commission and from Science Europe. And it also has some machine actionable content, uh, amongst other things, uh, a built-in guide for confidentiality classification of, of the data material, which I will show you in a bit. There are also two other tools that are available for the institution or administrative users as a policy manager where the institution there can <clears throat> create machine actionable versions of their policies, uh, which are then uh, exposed and embedded into this, uh, this data management plan tool so that the researchers can see the policies from their institution. And a third, there's the DMP oversight or DMP archive, which um, uh, provides an administrative overview of all the data management plans that are registered for that institution in our system. So just shortly want to say a little bit about the background. Um, it was also touched upon in the previous um, presentation by, by Lorenzo. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the open science movement has been active for many years, but uh, they have mostly focused on uh, open access publications. This was also then acknowledged in this report from 2016 from the European Commission, um, that they also needed now to look seriously at opening up the data and have requirements around that in, in, um, in the funding programs. And also at the same time around 2016, the FAIR principle were introduced where they also uh, acknowledged the uh, urgent need to improve uh, infrastructures to support the reuse of, uh, of data. And they also highlighted the importance of metadata and uh, which again uh, makes the planning of, of data collection and similar things very important. And then again, as many of you probably know, from 2017, open access to research data and requirements for data management plans are now standard in, 
in the, all of EU's research and innovation program like Horizon 2020 and um, Horizon Europe. And this has also then of course trickled down into the national level on a, in this um, Ministry of Education national strategy for making research data open and accessible. They say that uh, they expect the research institutions to develop policies for research data. And these policies should also include guidelines uh, for the solutions, for which solutions should be used for handling different types of data. And also in the Research Council of Norway in their updated policy from 2020, it is now a requirement to, uh, to have a data management plan available when you sign a contract with them for, for funding of projects. And also, I just want to briefly mention the Turning FAIR into Reality report, where they introduced this ecosystem for FAIR data, um, where the point is that this data management plan in the center left is, uh, provides a hub of information for all FAIR digital objects that are to be handled in a project. And where you then describe all digital objects, that is research data that you collect and handle and where they are, are to be stored, uh, which repository to use, cloud services. And then uh, also describe standards, um, connect these to people, um, actors, researchers, funders, publishers. And also in the top left corner, data policies that then should uh, define and regulate um, the data objects, the data and, and the DMP standards. And also PIDs then are uh, um, assigned to everything and anything that moves in this system. This is ideal um, dream scenario, which we are of course uh, a bit far from having, but uh, we are getting there slowly. <clears throat> And I also just want to briefly mention these 10 principles for machine actionable DMPs that was published um, a couple of years ago. I'm not going to go through all of them. I just want to highlight number three, um, making poli policies should also, also be made available for machines, not only humans. And also the principle six, uh, that one should follow a common uh, data model for machine actionable DMPs. Does that work has been started and I think they're all uh, finished also in the RDA DMP common standard work, work group where they have established this uh, basic model for what to include in a data management plan. So it's kind of two levels here, the overarching information about contributors and contacts costs, some project information and funding. And then on the second level, there's uh, data set information, uh, where to distribute, store, archive, license to be used, and also information about security, privacy, technical resources, and, and metadata. So these are sort of the um, <clears throat> common elements that should be used in any data management plan. So yeah, that leads us back to our tools. So I'm gonna now focus mostly on the data management plan. You can go see it here for yourself. Just have to register with a, any email address and log in. I'm just now going to show a few screenshots. So the elements of our DMP, this is the high level information. There's some information on projects, uh, research responsibility, the institutions uh, that are the owner of the projects, some funding, information on ethical legal issues um, and some related resources. And then there's a second level where you describe one or more data packages as we have called them, where you then describe each package with a set of information um, elements. Uh, yeah, so there's an element where you then can get a classification guide for the data. I will show you this in a bit. And there's also you describe some information about data collection, how you how you manage file under under the way in the project, and then you provide some information on metadata storage and archiving for each of the data package packages you 
describe in your data management plan. So this is the sort of a mini uh, classification guide. You answer some basic questions about what kind of data you have. If it's data about people, uh, if yes, what kind of categories of personal data, if it's anonymous, general, or special categories. Uh, these categories are uh, from the GDPR uh, vocabulary. And also then you describe the sample size of your, of your data. And based on that, you get a sort of indication on the security classification level of this data, whether it's open, internal or restricted yellow, as in this case, or if it's confidential or strictly confidential. And so if you uh, have a data set with special categories, then the recommendation changes to higher level red data. But this is only an indication, uh, <clears throat> sort of a light guide. The, the researchers still have to have to talk to their um, data support personnel at the institution or data protection officer to make sure that their data is uh, in these categories. But this is a, an indication. And based on that, later on in data management plan, you get some, um, the policy of the institution will be shown to the researcher. So this is an, an example from an institution where they have defined data collection devices and the different recommendations on how to use them uh, based on this security classification. So this yellow uh, exclamation mark sign means that it can be used, it's allowed to use these devices, but uh, there may be some conditions that apply. And a green, green check mark means that it's allowed and recommended to use. And this changes then if, if the data is read or confidential, then uh, you see the policies or the recommendation changes a little bit. So there's less, less uh, devices you can use, devices or services, since it's uh, more strict, um, more confidential the data is. And the same goes for the data storage policies. Again, the institution here can uh, define uh, their own list of uh, storage devices or storage services and add uh, uh, yeah, descriptions or conditions for each of them, for each of these uh, security classification categories. So again, if it's higher level security data, there are less devices and less uh, services uh, that are recommended to use. Uh, so the green ones here are sort of national service providers who, who have high, um, high security data storage uh, solutions. So this is just a screenshot from, from the second tool, the, the policy manager where the institutions can actually create these uh, policies, the machine actionable versions of their policies. It's unfortunately only in Norwegian, but uh, here they can then define and set up each device uh, service and set the, uh, set the uh, level and uh, policy for each device. And then I'm going to briefly show also the third tool for the institution or administrative users. This is the DMP oversight or DMP archive, again, only in Norwegian, but here the institutional user, administrative user can see when, uh, this is a list of all data management plans from an institution, when it was created, who created it, um, responsible uh, department within the institution, title, how many data packages there are, and the classification level they have set in the uh, data management plan. And also this uh, ja, nei, that's yes and no. That means an indication of whether they have uh, chosen the uh, recommended services. In some cases, there are some cases where they can uh, select uh, another device than what is actually recommended. So that will then show up in this uh, overview. And they also have the opportunity to open the data management plan and uh, access and read it in full through the links on the, on the right. 
<clears throat> How are we on time, by the way? Time. Plenty of time, okay. Then I just wanna show this um, third, now I'm back in the, in the data management plan tool that the researcher use. So this is sort of a mini archiving guide uh, where we use data from uh, this Retree data registry, which provides um, a global list of uh, archive and storage uh, services with the, the, the institution themselves uh, put in the information, but it's uh, available through, through APIs. So we harvest the information. Uh, we have only now, um, we show the Norwegian institutions that are available in Retreat data. And so the researcher can, can select from a few parameters here on, on the left side, uh, what the archive um, provides, if they have a PID, if they have quality management, if they provide embargo services, and what kind of research disciplines they provide um, storage and archiving for. And based on those parameters, you, you get a list of available archives. And then you select one and um, yeah, it will appear in the, in the data management plan. And the problem with retree data is that it's, um, like I said, the institution themselves who add the information. So it's at best imprecise and at worst it's garbage sometimes. So, um, it's not a quality proof. Uh, yes, in, in Norway, it is. Uh, so yeah, I just want to end with this uh, kind of up, upwards going graph. Um, this shows the number of registered data management plans we have since our very first simple version of the data management plan and how the usage have uh, increased over the years, especially after we added these uh, different guides and uh, slowly changing the uh, data management culture. And hopefully this also will build more um, fair ecosystem services in, in Norway. So yeah, that was it for me. Thank you. All right, questions. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, my question is about the um, administration side. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how administrators at universities can keep track of, um, of you know, data management being created and also being complied with. <clears throat> yeah, they don't get any alerts or anything. So they have to sort of regularly go into the system and check uh, when things are added. Uh, then they just have to see whether they uh, are aligned with the with the policies they have then entered into our system through this yes no thing that I showed you and then and then if necessary they can then read the data management plan and may possibly contact the the person who is responsible for for making the plan if they see something that is they have questions about so yeah. 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 Go ahead. Hi. Just a quick follow-on question. Um, so, what happens when the data is then shared publicly? Is is the data linked to the record to the DMP records, or is there a link being created somehow? Unfortunately, not yet. No. Um, so, the data management plan is now, for now, sort of independent from where it will be archived. So, but we are an archive ourselves. So, if they archive. At us, our, at our services, there there is a link through through the project information. The answer to that is version two. Yes, version two. Yes. Um, any other questions? You were just waiting for me to be done, weren't you? So, concerning uh, machine actionability. Um... Do you use the information from the uh, DMP tool anywhere else in your systems? Other DMP tools, you mean? I mean, uh, you mentioned machine actionability on the data management plans, and you can yeah. use information in DMP tool to do other stuff. At uh, SND, we're considering using information from DMP for to 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 sort of start up a a data description for publication of data, for instance. Yeah. 
to, to reuse that information from the DMPs. Yeah, again, it's only internal in, in within the SICT system. You can you reuse because we have this data management plan tool and we also have this where projects have to notify us about data protection if they have uh, if they are handling um, sensitive data then they also have to fill out a form but there's some information there that can be reused in the data management plan tool and there's also like i mentioned earlier the, the archive some elements there that can also be reused from the data management plan into the the archiving process so but basically only on the project level all right anything else all right can we give all of our speakers a warm round of applause thank you this was really really interesting i really appreciated it and we ended a little bit early but don't run away the closing sessions at three you want to be there gives you a little time to stretch your legs and we'll see you all in g3 in about 20 minutes thanks very much